Okay, so uh, now we're going to talk about coma. Coma is a little bit different than um, sphere collaboration because it uh, it is affected by the radial position of the point source. So remember, sphere collaboration affects everything equally, no matter where it is in your field of view. Coma becomes worse the farther away you are from the optical axis. So, um, and, and it's, the definition of this is, is really that the magnification depends on the location of the ray in the pupil, which is, is really to say the location that the ray crosses the lens, right? So um, it, it's, it's called coma because it looks like a comma, or not a comma, comet, sort of. Um, you, you, you can see how we have like a, a dark, a bright spot, and then um, kind of like a cone that comes off of it with, with a clear circle in it. And that's, that's classic coma. And uh, this, if you draw a, a line down the center, this will go through the center of your optical axis. And so if you have multiple of these things, um, they will, uh, also point towards your optical axis and they will meet like somewhere over here. And, um, and that's how you, you um, that, that's what, a very clear indication that this is coma, right? When they all point towards your optical axis. Um, so this is, uh, a, this occurs because um, as your theta varies, right? So as your theta varies, this theta, which is the angle of your rays with the optical axis, as theta varies, the outer rays vary more or less. More or less than the inner ones. Um, and you can see it on this, this plot beautifully. Um, the bottom ray, right, is does not deviate nearly as much as the top ray. So if you look at the top ray here, let's change to a green. So it, um, this top ray, when it this angle here, it makes with the interface, and then the angle it makes afterwards with the interface are relatively large compared to the angles that the bottom ray makes. As a result, our nonlinearity, right, the nonlinearity that occurs because of our Snell's law, is greater for the top ray than for the bottom ray. And um, as a result, the top ray meets at a point that is lower, um, the top ray and the bottom ray meet at a point that is lower than the inner rays. The inner rays are relatively undeviated and meet right there. And the, the consequence is, is you get what looks like this cone with a, a circle around it. Um, if you're using coherent light or relatively coherent light, you'll actually see a beautiful diffraction pattern form, which is shown here on the right-hand side. Um, and this one actually, has multiple colors because they used uh, relatively coherent but uh, non-monochromatic light, which is interesting. So um, coma is mostly corrected using the same techniques as um, uh, sphere collaboration. Let's, uh, so, you know, when you use a best form lens, which we talked about up here, uh, where do we talk about it here? A best form lens is also going to be close to the minimum for coma. It's not going to be exactly the same, but it's pretty close. Um, and also the, the same techniques that minimize the angles that the rays make with the, um, with the interfaces are going to minimize coma because coma occurs because of that nonlinearity. So this design here is going to have much, much lower coma in addition to having much, much lower sphere collaboration. So if we keep scrolling down, we actually can see, a, uh, well, here's a demonstration of what sphere collaboration looks like for um, with and without it. it. It often looks very much like a, a defocusing. It just makes things look hazy. Um, but on the right-hand side is an ex excellent example of what coma looks like. And you can see that all of these um, tails point towards our, uh, and actually you can see that the optical axis is um, right about here. It's not, it's not the center 
most bright center is actually a little bit lower. So if you, um, which is kind of interesting, right? So you can tell where the optical axis is because all of these rays point, all these uh, comets point to that. Now, one uh, sphere collaboration and coma are important because they both affect the point spread function of an optical system. Also called a PSF. Uh, point spread function is important um, because a point spread function is essentially the image of a point, um, uh, a single point of light. Uh, remember that our thin lens equation assumes that all of the rays that leave a point source of light meet at exactly the same point um, in space. And, and so it forms another point. But as we've seen from our ray tracing software, and you can see from um, up here, that is not the case. Um, you can imagine all these rays are coming from a point source way off at infinity. Um, and they're not meeting at a single point, they're meeting in over, uh, over an area, right? And so what a po uh, point spread function is, is the image of a point source is, is really, that's all it is. Um, and uh, one other aberration affects the point spread function and that is, excuse me, it's astigmatism. Mm -hmm. Astigmatism. And that's where you have different focal lengths for different directions. So um, here's an example uh, um, of astigmatism where we have a point source of light and it is shining through a lens and being focused and the rays that are traveling in this direction, we'll call this the, um, uh, well, the blue direction, right? The blue direction is so a horizontal. You'll notice that the angle that the the horizontal rays make with the um, lens are the same on the left and right side. They're gonna be symmetric. However, as you move down, the rays on the bottom are gonna become increasingly, uh, uh, have decreasing angles with the interfaces while the rays on top have an increasing angle with the interface. And that means that the rays on top are gonna become increasingly nonlinear And what it's gonna do is it's gonna force the focal um, plane, focal point for these rays that are purple or pink in this, in this to be different than the rays that are blue. So the blue ones meet here roughly and the, the pink ones meet here. And what's interesting about this is if you change your image sensor, your image sensor, if you move it, um, closer, like in this direction, if you put your image sensor here, you'll see a vertical line. Uh, well, it'll be more like an oval, actually. Um, and then as you move it even closer and you move it to here, if you move your image sensor here, that, that um, vertical oval will change to a horizontal oval. And in between, you'll see something that looks, you know, in between. <laughs> and it will slowly change in between the two. Um, the circle of least confusion right here, we've talked about that, is the um, circle at which uh, the diameter of your beam is the smallest. And so that is considered the, the focal plane. Um, we can see what this looks like. So let's start share, let's, uh, let's stop sharing here and share our, Jupiter notebook. And if we do that, I've, I've uh, set up a quick demo of coma. So uh, we have our, our two inch diameter, 100 millimeter lens again. Um, and we've, we've made two, in fact, you know what? Let's increase this angle here. So the angle of the second one is 0.6. Uh, let's make this 0.5 or, or point two. Um, now that's, that's better. It's 
it's much more dramatic. <laughs> and we can, um, if you see now, the blue rays are, are creating, or have a focal point that is below the red rays. And we can focus in on that point. Um, since I've changed that, we're gonna have to change these dimensions here real quick. So it's actually a little bit closer. So we'll have to focus in between 100 and say 120. So let's change this to 100. Actually, that should be fine. We just gotta change the top and bottom now. So the bottom will be 15 and the top will be 24. So if we do that and plot it, oh, that did not show up. Why did that not show up? Uh, top, bottom. Hmm. I don't know. Well, we can just focus onto this, uh, this image right here. Um, you can see the blue, uh, blue rays meet, have a focal point that's below this red line. And that red line is the center line essentially. And it's the least, that's not quite the least deviated line, but it almost is. And so as we move uh, closer to the, the optical axis, rays closer to the optical axis, um, those rays have focal points that move up, right? And that's what forms our, our coma. Um, the blue rays, let's say if we put our uh, camera right here, right um, where the red rays meet, you would see that the blue rays actually would form a circle, which is exactly what we see um, in that picture that I showed you on in the lecture notes. So I'm going to try, oh, this is why I didn't change it here. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, so point two, we can see it a little bit better here if I change this to point two. There we go. So you can see that the blue rays have their intersection right here um, and they're well below this red line which is roughly the, the middle rays, like I said. And the, the red rays, which are the inner rays, the rays that pass through the middle of our lens, the middle of our pupil, um, have a focal point that's well above it. And so it, this is a confusing picture. It doesn't look exactly the same as the one we had in our lecture notes because we have two things going on here. We have both coma and spherical aberration occurring. The spherical aberration is moving the focal point inward for the blue rays and um, coma is moving it down. So we have two things happening, which is, why when we correct one, we typically correct the other. Not completely, but we can get, um, get them much better. All right, so the next lecture, we are going to talk about um, field curvature, which is when the focal plane changes with lo changes location with height.